like me? Why are you so much more interesting than I find myself to be? I know that I might cause a scene, but have you ever thought that might just be what I want? Did you hear about the time that I killed a guy? Or about the time I lied and said I killed a guy? I know that I don't want to be alone, no I don't want to be alone anymore than you do. You're watching Studio Logia, featuring Skirkova. Seek truth, defend reason. Music for Studio Logia is performed by Gokart Mozart and is used with permission. Hello YouTube. I have been graciously invited by David P. Witham to engage him in a debate, in this video being my opening remarks, on the question of whether or not an atheistic worldview can support a consistent morality. I've taken the affirmative position on that question, and so I'll speak first. Please subscribe to David's channel, which I will link right here, so that you can view his response and subsequent entries into this debate. Also, while I've not had a chance to see all of his videos, what I have seen has impressed me that he is a man who, while we disagree, nevertheless takes his intellectual responsibility seriously. He's an Orthodox Christian and just has a very um, interesting and unique perspective that we here in the atheist and theist debate on YouTube rarely see. Uh, and let me say to you personally, David, thank you for inviting me. Now to business. Can an atheistic worldview support a consistent morality? I think it absolutely can. I don't think the question of religion, or lack thereof, has any bearing whatsoever on morality. Now, I'm not here to argue that religion is immoral. I'm here to argue that morality exists as a separate compartment from religion, or irreligion, in the human animal, as well as the human scholar. While religion and morality can, and often do, influence one another, I think the position that one creates, or gives rise to the other, is untenable, even nonsensical. An essentially moral nature is an evolved attribute of the human species. This is supported by comparisons to other animal species, cross-cultural surveys of moral attitude, and all relevant data from psychology, anthropology, and other fields. This is further belied by the fact that sociopaths, who lack this intuitive moral nature, are seen as fundamentally damaged individuals. Their situation is never connected causally to religion by any respected academic authority. We simply don't need to refer to religion, good or bad, when we're discussing day-to-day -day morality. More complex, deliberated moralities, such as might be examined in a college ethics course, arise largely from traditions of secular philosophy, going back to ancient Greece or even farther. They appeal to axioms, empirical observations, the human experience, and various other realms, some subjective, others less so. But no serious scholar in our modern Western academic tradition would justify their moral perspective in exclusively religious terms, even if they were devoutly religious themselves. Certainly a Catholic, say, graduating from the University of Notre Dame with a degree in ethics, would make some references to Augustine and Aquinas. But they would be hard-pressed to earn their degree without being conversant in Plato, Kant, Locke, and Nietzsche as well. A totally secular student at a more secular school, on the other hand, might never learn very much about Augustine or Aquinas, but not be considered any worse off for it when applying to grad school. As with day-to-day -day morality, we just don't need to refer to religion very much when we're discussing more complex and coherent moral philosophies. This seems counterintuitive to us, because we're products of a culture that strongly associates morality with religion. The moral differences between religious and non-religious people seem very obvious to many observers on both sides of this question. But uh, let's examine this. C.S. Lewis, in Mere Christianity, argued for an objectivist morality, and hence for God, on the grounds that without such an objective standard, morality cannot reconcile the is-ought dilemma, brought to you by David Hume. However, apart from being an appeal to consequences, and therefore a non-sequitur, this argument is also problematic because Lewis never explains why the reader should think that a god or other universal arbiter actually does resolve the is-ought dilemma. You see, a religious belief is not like a preference or an opinion. When a Christian says that they believe Jesus died and was resurrected, they're not expressing a feeling, although feelings are usually associated, or holding forth on a matter of taste, they are making a statement of what they believe to be fact, 
a statement that is, by necessity, either true or false. Now let's say that I believe it to be a fact that God exists, and furthermore that the accounts of His Son, Jesus, from the Bible are essentially accurate. I could still decide to disagree with God's morality. I would point out at this point that such a person would not be an atheist, and conversely an atheist is not such a person, by definition. But of course, most people who believe the truth claims of a religion also hold to a moral perspective that is within some critical tolerance of their mainstream co-religionists. That is to say, most people who believe Jesus is God also believe that Jesus is good. But this is not essentially different from the non-religious moral influences that we all experience. For example, opponents and proponents of racial slavery rarely disagree on whether or not it's acceptable to enslave an equally worthy human being, or they disagree for the most part is on whether or not members of the subjugated ethnic group constitute equally worthy beings. There are exceptions, such as those who inhabit a gray area of acknowledging a subjugated race's equality, but shy away from the consequences of this acknowledgement, such as Thomas Paine or Thomas Jefferson, prominent figures from America's Revolution. But this is not a difference. We see the same thing with religion. There are, for example, secular Jews and cultural Catholics each of whom don't believe in the metaphysics of their religions, but do follow the teachings for cultural reasons. And there are many, many people who implicitly accept a religion as true, but don't examine their own actions in light of that religion's teachings. Some of you out there hearing me may be thinking to yourselves, something's missing. There are large groups of people that live in unified communities of moral philosophy. They have coherent moral philosophies, which arise directly from the teachings of their religious community. Where is the secular equivalent to that? Well, I say that's a good question, but I think we can address it pretty quickly in light of what we've already discussed here. Yes, there are large communities of religious people who share particular moral views on things like sexuality, dress and appearance, the role of women. A good example of this might be the Amish who do not use some forms of modern technology. But these are not coherent moral philosophies. Now, I'm not saying that they are incoherent, necessarily, just that they are simply not functioning on the same level as the academic philosophies we discussed earlier. I'll use a secular counterexample to illustrate that what we're observing is not unique to religion. U.S. military dress and appearance standards. The Amish, varying somewhat by sect, are united in their rejection of photography and most labor-saving devices. The U.S. military, varying somewhat by branch, enforces strict standards on haircuts and proper wearing of the uniform. But it is not the case that the Amish see something morally repugnant in capturing an image with an artificial device, or feel that a horse is morally superior to a tractor. Rather, they see photography as potentially leading to vanity and labor-saving farm equipment is leading to self-reliance, individualism, and pride. It is a true or false belief of theirs that such things are offenses to God. In fact, most religious taboos are rooted in a belief that a particular sin will offend God. It's pragmatic, even though an emotional sense of devotion is usually involved. Likewise, the U.S. military does not believe that it's immoral for men to have long hair, or that long hair inhibits discipline. Rather, they've decided that short hair is a good way to establish uniformity, which in turn encourages unit cohesion, and that strict uniform standards will instill a sense of dignity and pride in the uniform. Again, it's a question of factual beliefs and pragmatism. It's not immoral for a man to have long hair, but it is immoral for a man to violate an agreement, and soldiers agree to keep their hair short when on duty. It's a means to an end, based on what facts one accepts as true. Incidentally, there is also a sense of emotional attachment and devotion that many service members feel, esprit de corps. Another temptation is to distinguish between the two on the grounds that the soldier will abandon these rules as soon as he retires or is discharged, whereas the Amish believer will keep these rules for her entire life. But this is a superficial distinction, having nothing to do with the taboo, only with the true or false beliefs that underpin it. The military makes no assumptions that suggest their taboo should be lifelong whereas the Amish do. In fact, both the military and the Amish community would be prepared to change their taboos if it were discovered that they were not an effective means to the intended end. If a study came out which conclusively showed that short hair reduced discipline, 
military commanders would seriously discuss changing the policy. If the Amish community, for whatever reason, felt that God revealed to them that he valued crop yields, say, rather than humility, they would seriously consider changing their taboos. Of course, both scenarios are unlikely, and neither group would make a decision lightly. That's not the point. Now, it would be dishonest of me to close this thesis without addressing divine command theory, henceforth referred to as DCT. I've attempted to establish that no particular religious perspective can compete with serious scholarly treatments of morality, but many would argue that DCT stands proxy for all of theism in this role. Essentially, it's the position that God's commands and morally good actions are literally identical. They are the exact same thing. I want to make two distinct points here. First, DCT is useless for establishing religion as morally superior to atheism. And second, that it is highly problematic and uniquely controversial among serious academic scholars. Now as to the first point, DCT is just one of many meta-ethical ideas about what morality is and where it comes from. It has nothing to say about the actual content of that morality. While it is relevant to the study of ethics, it is not truly an ethical system unto itself. It offers no insight into what God's actual commands are, and so it can't be grounds for criticizing non-religious morality. For the second point, DC2 has two distinct logical problems. First, it's argued that it commits the naturalistic fallacy. And I quote, If, for example, it is believed that whatever is pleasant is and must be good, or that whatever is good is and must be pleasant, or both, it is committing the naturalistic fallacy to infer from this that goodness and pleasantness are one and the same quality, states G. E. Moore in Principia Ethica. A more easily understood analogy for this would be to conflate the attributes of weight and mass. In my case, my weight and mass are about 100 kilograms. As long as I'm on Earth, within a certain tolerance of sea level, these two figures will be equivalent. But it would be folly to assume that weight and mass are the same quality, because on the moon, my weight will be around 17 kilograms, but my mass will remain around 100. Second, DCT is dogged by the Euthyphro Dilemma, which was posed by Plato as, Is the pious loved by the gods because it is pious? Or is it pious because it is loved by the gods? The supporter of DCT must choose between a god who arbitrates morality because might makes right, and a god that is limited in scope by a system of moral imperatives which exist independently of him. In fairness, there are a number of solutions to the Euthyphro Dilemma on offer, especially in this age of the internet, and these get a lot of mileage in discussion forums, Bible study groups, and RCIA type classes. However, without getting bogged down into particulars, I really must point out that none of these solutions has had any success with moving the consensus of serious ethical scholars. In sum, my position is, yes, an atheistic worldview can support a consistent morality. An individual has the same access to morality regardless of their belief or disbelief in God. This issue is much like the controversy surrounding evolution. Among the most respected minds on both topics, there is no controversy. It may sound elitist, but if I were a philosophy professor, my colleagues would not take this debate seriously. Yet the world we live in, sadly, does take this question seriously. Once, it took seriously the question of whether women could be as intelligent as men. Once, the world took seriously the question of whether a black person was truly human. It still takes seriously the question of whether a gay couple can love each other as much as a straight couple. Dear viewers, let's settle this question. Thank you.